Welcome to coupled, decoupled, headed, headless, what does it all mean? It's quite a mouthful and we will get through all of it. Um, I promise it's not going to be too technical or too in the weeds. So if you're, if you're new to this, you're in the right place. Uh, if you'd like to follow along with the slides, it is available at tinyurl.com slash where's the head ADC 24. Um, yeah. So a little bit about me. I'm Kyle Anaker. I am a Drupal architect, lead developer, um, recently turned full-time contractor at the beginning of this year. Um, been working for myself, it's been going great, which is awesome. And I get to, you know, the chance to come out to these camps and speak and uh, get to meet people. So on Drupal.org, you can find me as Control Adele. Um, other places I go by Kyle Eineker or Control Adele. So if you want to um, tweet me or Mastodon me or whatever we're calling it now, that's how you can find me. Or if you want to connect on Slack afterwards, um, just hit me up. Uh, into the meat of it. So. Before we really get into anything, we have to understand the analogy that's commonly used for, for this type of conversation and kind of understand what the underlying technical concepts are. So in the most simplest form, most websites have a front end and a back end. The front end is the presentation layer. It is the part of the site that your users, your the visitors to your site interact with um, and really kind of is the brand, the look, the feel, everything to do with user interaction. And then you have the back end, right? Where the content is created, where it's stored, where it's authored, where it's updated. And the back end is a little bit more complicated. There's different parts and pieces to it, right? So you have your database, you have an admin UI usually, you have a web server, you have caching layers, et cetera, et cetera. But for the sake of this conversation, we're gonna say we have a front end and we have a back end. And that's kind of the just general architecture we're gonna be talking about. So the analogy when we're talking about coupled, headed, de um, decoupled, headless, et cetera, that people use is with a robot. So typically they'll say you have a robot, the head of that robot is your front end and body of your robot is your back end. So we're gonna continue with that analogy, but I do have a small tangent. So this analogy took me a long time to truly understand because when you say the head of something, you think the thing that's in charge and the thing that's making decisions, but your front end doesn't make decisions. It's not in charge of anything. It's just presenting something. So. It took me a, a while to kind of come to terms with a head in this analogy is just the presentation layer, but the body is actually doing all of the logic and making all the decisions and delivering everything. But for the analogy, the head is the front end and the body is the back end. Uh, and then we have on to the terminology. So, headed and or native, this is what you'll see in most CMSs, uh, as far as the analogy goes, if you buy a robot on Amazon, it's gonna come with a head, right? You buy a robot, you get a full robot. And you can't take the head off, you can't swap the heads, you just get a robot. So you're, you got your robot head front end, your body back end, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. It's kind of what you see in most technologies, right? Most CMSs, Drupal, WordPress, etc. you're going to get both a head, and a back end, um, or front end and a back end together, all as one. It changes a little bit though when you talk about headless. So if you were to buy a headless robot on Amazon, you just get the body, you'd get no head. You'd get what's shown here, uh, a body with a bunch of wires or a bunch of connectors and you'd be expected to bring your own head or build your own head, connect your own head in some way. So, and this is, um, the lack of a head is considered a feature, right? So when you go look at Contentful or other headless SaaS, uh, competitors to Drupal, they'll market heavily that the lack of a head is a feature because you get to build your own. To me, it seems like you're missing half of the product, right? Because you can't have a website without a head. So why is it a good thing that your product doesn't come with a head? That seems extremely uh, counterintuitive. But the marketing people have made it work. So when we're talking headless, really we're talking about a CMS that has no presentation layer baked in or an API first CMS tool that fully supports um, a, an API implementation on the front end. When we're talking about coupled, this is a little bit different. Um, your, your native or your um, headed approaches are also coupled approaches. So when you have your head and you have your body, if they're connected in a bunch of wire, or they're connected with a bunch of wires that are all mangled together and they're hard to separate and it's really uh, challenging to put a new head on, then you're coupled, right? You're stuck with the body you have, you're stuck with the head you have, and the wires really 
sure you could make it work you could rewire it but it's going to be a lot of effort and the payoff is probably not going to be worth it so on a coupled solution you have what you have you have the front end you have you have the back end you have you're just going to make it work with what what's there in a decoupled solution the idea is to make it so that your head is swappable to different backends and the reality is that when people say they've decoupled their site, they very rarely actually truly decouple their site because very few businesses, organizations, enterprises have a need for a pluggable front end to a different back end. But they'll still say that they've decoupled their site. And we'll get into what they mean by that later. Uh, the, the most important thing with decoupled is to understand that there should be a defined interface or abstraction between your front end and your back end. And that should be a great, like, a great contract between your back end and your front end so that you can serve components, you can serve content, and some other JavaScript developer can look at your API, digest it, write a front end, and they have need to know nothing about your back end, right? They just know what your API publishes. So that um, is a lot more complex than it sounds because there are no open source specs for what a decoupled content management system API should look like. You kind of have to define it yourself, right? It's proprietary. And that's why nobody ever really does this because it's a lot of work to create a generic abstract API of what a content architecture is, especially when your content architecture is usually business or organization or site specific. So you won't see a lot of examples of this in the wild or just when you're building sites. But in the real world, we actually have two really good examples. So you can kind of think about this like USB-C and Lightning. Um, they've done a really good job of making it plug and play, where you just take a USB-C, you plug it into two things, and assuming they're both following the spec and meant to be plugged into each other, they'll figure it out, right? It just kind of works. And then we have another one, right? Apple Lightning. So that's a proprietary decoupled connector um, that only really works with Apple things, but it's two really good examples of companies or specifications, organizations that have taken the effort to define a, an API, a spec, and they expect devices connecting to each other to follow it and connect and work you know, as the user would expect. But this is extremely rare in the, the web space because it's a lot of work. And like I said, there's not a lot of place to start with. Uh, there, or there's not a strong starting point. You're usually starting from scratch. So like I said, when people say they've decoupled their site, typically what they're meaning is they've replaced the headed or native front end with a JavaScript front end but that JavaScript front end is actually coupled to their back end, right? So you built a React front end for your website. You can't take that React front end to another website or another back end, uh, but you have kind of defined or created a nice set of APIs to connect the two together. So it's better than coupled and there are benefits to it, but it's not truly decoupled because you can't take the two different parts and put them on different sites. So that, that's typically what most people mean when they say they decoupled the site. Um, unless you're working for a huge enterprise and there's truly a generic abstract API for your decoupled uh, API endpoints, it's not truly decoupled in the most you know, technical sense. We also have progressively decoupled. So this is kind of a mixture of both. Here, um, we've kind of taken the eye out of the robot. Don't feel too bad, it's just a robot. Um, so the majority of the, the interface, the front end, right, is still coupled to your back end. But there are some things where it just makes sense, right? You have another service or you have highly interactive or dynamic data where you want some flexibility and you want to kind of separate that out from the rest of your site. So when we're talking about progressively decoupled, we're saying, all right, search or a map or something. We're gonna make that use APIs and we're gonna put it on a, the headed front end. But this one part of the site is gonna use a, a decoupled API and just kind of render on the client side. Um, it could be coming from the content management system backend or like the blue box shows, it could be coming from some external service or it be, could be coming from both. Uh, it's really just a mixture of the two approaches together and it's really a, a great option when you don't want to dive into a fully decoupled solution or you already have an existed headed solution and um, you don't want to refactor everything. So that's kind of the terminology. I'll take a short pause. Anybody have any questions or want any clarifications on any of it? Next, we'll be looking at what it kind of what all these look like, kind of in practice, and the pros and cons for all of them. So, anything we want, we want to dive into here further? All right, on we go. 
Uh, so looking at these in practice, when we're talking about headed or native, we're always talking about a coupled solution. Um, even if, theoretically, if Drupal shipped with a React front end, it would still be a headed, native, or coupled front end because that React front end would not be built to work with WordPress or Contentful or another CMS. So even if the front end is JavaScript, if it ships with the CMS and there's no ability to use another backend, it is headed, native, or coupled. Uh, in the Drupal world, our, our headed solution is Twig, right? We do PHP rendering through Twig and we all serve it through the, the uh, bootstrapping Drupal. So in, in this approach, your front end and your back end are tightly coupled together and separating them out is a lot of effort and a lot of pain. Um, and the CMS provides both the, the content management and the presentation layer. For site owners, what this means is that you can leverage out of the, bunch, out of the box functionality kind of without worrying about it, right? So you get stuff like content preview, all the fields and configuration and forms and settings that you can access work as expected and do what you expect them to do, uh, which you can't always take for granted with the other approaches. The Some of the you know challenges is that Drupal can be big and complex and intimidating, right? How you build it, how you expose it to an author, it can be a lot for them to learn or understand or figure out the nuances for just because Drupal's been around for so long and like the admin interface of Drupal if you're new to it, is extremely daunting and there can be a lot of areas where it's not clear how to author what you want to author or change the, the page how you want to change it. Um, the upside of this is that your authoring experience can be a lot more powerful or flexible because you have that tight coupling between your front end and your back end. It's a lot easier to expose more power and more flexibility to that author. Um, also, ironically, um, implementations can lack flexibility, right? If you, if you get a bad implementation and you don't correctly predict the level of flexibility or the business requirements or the business logic, you can build something that doesn't fit the needs of the site and suddenly your authors are fighting the site to get what they need done. And changing those decisions can be really hard because you're tightly coupled together. Often if you're changing the front end or you're changing the back end, there's a knock-on effect later on somewhere that has to be taken into account for. Uh, also, with your, your headed or your native approaches, at least with Drupal, interactions, immersive content, dynamic content can be challenging to build because we're doing server-side rendering and we're serving everything through Twig. Getting kind of the interactiveness or the engagement, um, immersiveness that you would expect from a JavaScript site can be challenging. There are definitely ways to work around that, but just by default with Twig, it, it's not a particularly easy. Um, an upside, for this approach is that all or most pages can be managed as content, which once again, you can't take for granted with the other approaches. Um, being able to you know, pop up a random page and add it to the menu might not be possible in other approaches. Um, if you have a highly complex page, there are certainly like things with Contentful where a developer might just build out that page by hand as code, whereas with the headed approach, it's almost always gonna be content, right? It's always gonna be editable in some form or fashion. Uh, and then for this, as a site owner, it's just good to know that your pages are being rendered on the server. They're not being rendered client side um, or in other places. All right. So for headed, um, for the headed approach for developers, some some good to know things are that you're stuck working in the technology of the CMS, right? So if you're a Go developer and you're working on Drupal, you're going to be working in PHP. There's there's no way to work in Go and Drupal at the same time. Uh, you're also generally stuck with the best practices and structures um, as they're defined by the CMS. So if you were to take Drupal's best practices and try to apply them to WordPress, that's going to go really poorly, right? You kind of have to follow the what's been established as how to work in that CMS. Um, it's really great because your content architecture is well integrated into your front end. And typically, if you can do something in your content architecture in the back end, there's some way to get that to a, into the front end that's reasonable and is as flexible as your back end is. Uh, one of the downsides is that often if you're making a front end change, right, you're changing a template or you're changing the theme, you're going to have to do a full CMS deployment to update your site. Uh, you can't kind of just deploy to the back end or the front end. You're doing a full deployment with everything. Um, because it's so tightly integrated, it can also be really hard to tell where your content management system stops and your presentation layer begins. Because, especially with Drupal, it's getting better now with single directory components, but 
you have your content entities and then you have your templates and you have your pre-processes and it's really easy to kind of mix them all together and sure you get what you want out at the end but the keeping track of it as a developer can be really challenging and then also with this headed approach it can be challenging to source content from other systems because your backend server is rendering all the content and assumes it's controlling all of the page, you somehow need to bring the content into the backend server and render it out through Twig. Uh, and that, that can be challenging or slow. It can have performance impacts, caching impacts, etc. cetera. Um, you can call this one simpler because everything is provided by the one technology, right? Everything's provided by Drupal and it should all work together. Right, so it's simpler in the sense that you have less technologies in play. They're they're known to work together. It's a known good combination, um, but it could also be considered more complex because of the tight coupling and the tight integrations. As it can be harder to tell where one thing stops and another be, um, begins. So, Drupal use cases for this type of approach, pretty much every site you can think of can be done through a headed approach. Um, I would I generally start thinking about not using headed when we're talking about sites that do end user authentication, right? So if every, every user to your site is going to be logged in, Drupal can do that. It won't do that as performantly as other options. Um, if you have complex interactions, right? If every page has some complex interaction on it, maybe don't go headed. Or if every page is like a dynamic data table that has like thousands of rows that you need to render, also maybe not the best case for Drupal. Um, sorry, for headed Drupal. But it's very requirement and context dependent. Um, Drupal is extremely flexible and extremely powerful. And if you get the right Drupal architect or the Drupal um, implementation right, then even, even some of these cases, like you, you'll still be faster than some JavaScript implementations if you do it right in Drupal. Uh, another thing to consider is the team you have available. So if you have a Drupal developer team, this uh, Headed option will usually be the cheapest of all the architectures because you just need Drupal developers. That being said, Drupal developers are really hard to find. So if you have them, great. If you need to go find them, maybe not so great. All right, on to decoupled. So just a reminder, this is the one where we've created uh, a defined interface between the front end and the back end, and we kind of expect them to be pluggable or swappable. Or if we're using the looser term of decoupled, we're creating a rack front end for Drupal and replacing Twig or not using Twig at all in a fully decoupled solution. So here the CMS still provides the content management, but the presentation layer is built by um, React or another JavaScript front end, or it doesn't have to be JavaScript at all, some other front end technology, something else is handling the rendering of the content. Um, and Drupal or the CMS is only providing the content management and the API for that content. A, a great thing about this is that it makes it really easy to source content from other systems because you're already decoupling the entirety of your front end. What's the difference between if you're pulling content from one backend or two backends or three backends? And that can change page to page, component to component. It's really easy to, to uh, get the content directly from the source instead of having to adjust it into Drupal somewhere. That being said, somewhere sometimes it's still easier to ingest it into Drupal. Um, as I was saying, few teams really need this or build this because there's so much effort that has to go into building that abstract decoupled API interface layer. Unless you're a truly huge enterprise, like there's just, it's overkill. The, the decoupled, Let's see, the decoupled React front end for one site makes sense. The decoup doing a fully abstract API for one site does not make sense. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, and then because we're decoupling, you get to choose the technology of your team's choice, right? So if you have React developers, Vue developers, Next developers, whatever have you, Svelte developers, um, it's really easy to build the front end in the technology that your team knows or wants to learn instead of being stuck with Twig, which most front-end developers don't really like. For site owners, what this means, um, probably the most important one and the most costly one is that 
you have to build a front end, custom front end application, right? You're pretty much starting from scratch. There might be some starting points here and there, but you're doing a full, almost full custom implementation of your front end. Um, and with that, you can lose access to parts of the CMS because in order to support all the functionality that Drupal has and all the contrib modules that Drupal has, there needs to be some representation of that on the front end and you're building a custom, right? So if you do your initial site build and you say you're not using this feature of Drupal, then your front end developers aren't probably going to build in that feature into the components. And then if you want to use it in the future, you have to go back and add it into the components. So it's just kind of one of those gotchas where it might go well at first, but then as you look to change or add things on, you can find that, oh, we didn't have this, or this doesn't work as expected because it was never built into the component to begin with. Um, some common examples of this are like content preview, right? So in a fully decoupled application, you can't just use Drupal's preview page. You have to have some other preview system in place. Um, and that's usually some form of staging site or local or something where you have to visit a different domain outside of the page editing experience to actually see what your content's gonna look like. Um, Fields and configurations, as I said, may not work as expected, right? So maybe there's like the promotion field when you're editing a node, right? That might not do anything for your component, but it's still gonna be there unless somebody's removed it. So there could be confusion for authors where they're trying to use things that look like they should work, but they don't and nothing changes. And that can make it really difficult to tell how change that you make on the admin interface will be reflected on the front end or if it will at all. Uh, another downside to this is that page changes can be dependent on developers making a code change. So if part of a page is being sourced from Drupal, but another part of the page is just written as a React component or a JavaScript component, you're not gonna be able to change that as an author, right? You have to wait for a code deployment and the developer to go change that part of the page, even though you can control maybe the top half, but not the bottom half. Um, interactions and immersive experiences, though, get a lot easier to support because you have JavaScript now and you're not dependent on server-side rendering. So it's really easy to make, you know, the button bounce or make it slide in and out or do some scroll animations. It's really easy to add all that in when you're not tied to just sending uh, generally HTML and a little bit of JavaScript with your component. It's also easier to make independent, um, it's easier to change decisions that have been made on the front end or the back end independently, because there's usually, because you have some type of API interface between the two, if the back end changes and the API doesn't change, or the front end changes and doesn't need the API to change, you can make those changes independently, and you don't have the kind of that knock on effect you have with headed where if you change something, it probably is going to change something on the front end and you have to go take into account the whole chain. Not saying that doesn't happen, but like if you were to change a field name in Drupal, right, with Twig, that's going to be really painful because you have to go redo all your templates. But with like JSON API, you can just remap the old property to the new property and it will just be kind of seamless, assuming the data structure doesn't change. Um, Another benefit is that you can manage content from multiple sites from one CMS. So you could have a tag on your nodes in Drupal and that could be filtered through the API and you could serve content. You could manage content in you know, one Drupal instance for any number of Drupal sites. And similarly, you can source content from multiple different services for one site. So theoretically, if you had you know, five Drupal sites and you wanted content from all five in one front end, it'd be really easy to aggregate all those um, all that content through an API rather than trying to mesh it all together through some Drupal service in the back end. Uh, and a security benefit is that because you're not exposing the Drupal's front end directly, you can put Drupal behind a firewall or a VPN or something so that your admin interface generally isn't accessible to people who don't need access to Drupal. For developers, um, the benefits of going decoupled is that you're usually decoupling to a JavaScript front end with a REST, JSON, GraphQL, et cetera, API backend. So it's a pattern that a lot of JavaScript developers are familiar with. So you're not dependent fully on Drupal front end developers. You have a much broader market for just JavaScript developers in general. 
Uh, you get to build the presentation layer and the technology of your choice, whether it's React, Vue, um, Next, what have you. And this approach can be well integrated with the content architecture if it's done right. right? So there's nothing saying that just because there's an abstraction and it's decoupled that you can't have a strong type system in your front end that reflects your content architecture in the back end. That's really just up to the team to implement. Um, when you're making front end changes, they usually don't require a CMS deployment. So if you want to add a new component or tweak how a component looks or add some more interactions, you can typically deploy your front end without having to do a full CMS uh, back end deployment. There's a very clear boundary between where content management stops and the presentation layer begins. So it's really easy to tell if there's going to be knock on effects or if you need both a back end and a front end change or even just as a developer, right? You can have developers that don't, don't know anything about Drupal and are just consuming the API. Um, and you can maybe have fewer Drupal developers and more JavaScript developers um, that don't need extensive knowledge of Drupal's inner workings to get their work done. The downside is that if you're truly decoupling, like I said, you need to create that content API abstraction so that you can plug and play your backends if you're um, really looking to seamlessly swap between different different front ends and different back ends to, for different sites. As I, I've kind of said a couple times, for decoupled, the use cases for this are really only big complex enterprises that are supporting multiple sites, multiple channels, multiple content sources. Um, there's very few actual use cases for most organizations even if they're fully, truly decoupling. But like I said, there's a lot of benefit to decoupling in the sense that you have an organized set of APIs that are going to a front end in JavaScript that is not Twig. So kind of going, going some of the way, but not all the way, you can see a lot of the benefits and just forget about a lot of the extra overhead and work that you need to truly say you're decoupled. On to headless. So this is the one where you buy your robot and they don't give you a head on purpose. They just kind of cut all that off and say, bring your own, build your own. Uh, the CMS here is still providing the content management side of things, but the CMS explicitly does not provide a presentation layer. It just says, figure it out yourself and exposes the content over an API. And then you get to choose the technology of your choice to implement it in. So one thing to be aware of here is that the headless SaaS solutions or the headless CMSs that are out there right now, they're all fairly new and their content management is getting better, but it's still fairly immature, right? So Drupal's what, 20 years old. We've been building out functionality for authoring and admin interfaces for that long. And we have a lot of features like translations and workflows, um, content moderation, config management, all that. And all the headless assets that have popped up over the last two, three, five years are still working on catching up, right? They're still working on building out all those features. So it's really important to understand what features you need from your CMS if you're going to cut this, because the, the SaaS solutions that are out there may not be sufficient, or some of the things you take for granted in Drupal may just not exist in that platform yet. It might be on the roadmap, but it's, it might not be there yet. It might not work like you expect because the team building it might not have as much depth or you know, experience in the CMS space as Drupal's developed just out of necessity. So what this means for site owners is once again, you have to build a custom front end application. You have no choice with this one. You have nothing else. You don't have a website. If you don't build a, a front end application, um, your content architecture is as powerful as the CMS is. That's kind of what I was just saying is that you just have to make sure that your CMS has all the features you expect and that they can all be exposed over the API as, uh, as you want. And here you're losing access, or you shouldn't lose as much access to the CMS because it's meant to be used headlessly, but you're still losing some access to parts that you would expect from a, a headed solution. So content preview can still be a challenge. Page layout can still be a challenge. Um, field configurations, it might not be clear what the mapping is between, you know, if I check this box, how does this impact the front end, can still be confusing. Um, and can still be challenging to, to know when or where that will be presented to the user. Um, because this is how this, right, is another form of decoupling, you still have the problem where some parts of the page might be content manageable, 
but other parts of the page might just be hard coded as code and require a developer change to update. Um, and because you know we're probably using a JavaScript front end again, the immersive, dynamic um, interactions, experiences are still easier to support. And we have a lot of the same benefits as decoupled here. So once again, we have an API in the middle, so it's easier to make changes on the back end or the front end uh, without having to change both of them necessarily. And you can still put that, that content management back end behind a VPN or firewall and secure it away from public access. For developers, headless, um, once again, it means you can decouple it to a front end solution of your choice using REST or JSON API or GraphQL or what have you. Uh, typically for CMSs that aren't Drupal, you're gonna kind of get one of those options. You won't have multiple. At least with Drupal, you kind of can pick and choose what API type you want. But typically you'll get maybe one, maybe two options for, for other CMSs. Uh, you get to build the presentation layer in the technology of your choice. Your front end changes don't always, or usually won't require front end deployment if you're making them. So once again, if you're tweaking components, you're changing the look and feel, you can just kind of redeploy your, your JavaScript application and not have to update your backend too much. We still have that clear boundary where content management starts. And you're gonna have to manage mapping of content between your API and your front end. So you just have to make sure that you have a, a good content architecture and a good representation of that in your, your front end components so that you're fully building out your components to match the features that are available from the API. Uh, for Drupal use cases, this is one that really starts to shine when you're doing a lot of end user authentication or you have really complex interactions, right? If you're building something more like an application than a website, going headless or fully decoupling makes a lot of sense. Or if you have lots of dynamic data, right? If you're sourcing things from a lot of places or just a lot of data to manage, it can make a lot of sense to, to start going headless. Um, yeah, and if you're using content from a lot of different sources, or if you just have a JavaScript team available, right? So if you have a developer team of 20 JavaScript developers and one Drupal developer, it probably makes sense to take an architecture or use an architecture that allows you to leverage that, that team that you have instead of making them all learn Drupal. So that, that's kind of the, the Drupal use cases for headless. The last one we'll cover is progressively decoupling. Uh, so in the Drupal world, this is really the best. Most of both worlds, you kind of get a lot of the benefits uh, without a lot of the complexity or a lot of the trade-offs with the, the headless or the fully decoupled approach. So in this approach, your CMS is providing the content management and the presentation layer, um, but your CMS can still expose content over an API. So for areas of the site that you want to be a bit more interactive or dynamic, you can progressively decouple that instead of fully decoupling everything. Uh, the majority of the presentation layer is done through your, your headed front end, your twig, et cetera, and then very specific parts are chosen to be done through some type of JavaScript and are considered islands of decoupling. Uh, for site owners, what this means is that you're mainly using the headed front end approach for pages. So you retain a lot of the headed benefits of almost every page is content authorable or most of the page will be content authorable. Um, you'll continue to be able to use most of the features. Most of the features will probably work as you're checking boxes or changing things in the admin interface, but you get the ability to selectively decouple parts of the site that uh, are more complex or you want something more than what you could typically get through a traditional CMS or what you consider a server-side rendering traditional HTML type layout. Um, and then yeah, fields and configurations work as expected. And probably one of the bigger benefits that you maintain is that you get to leverage out of the box functionality, right? So you can just kind of assume, at least in the Drupal ecosystem, that most modules will continue to work as expected and get the benefits of that. Uh, for developers, you're leveraging the head of experience for what it does well, right? So if you need to build a table of something, you can still use Drupal views and it will just work. Uh, but you get to use JavaScript for parts that it doesn't do well. And you can choose, pick and choose what content and what data you want to expose over the API um, to render through a JavaScript library. Um, but you can still place those decoupled areas using your headed approach, right? So you can use layout builder or paragraphs and you can say, this paragraph represents 
a decoupled table, right? And then Drupal can serve the JavaScript to render that section, but the authors can place it wherever they want on the page. So that's really powerful. A couple examples of, let's see, a couple of good examples of where it makes sense to start decoupling or progressively decoupling is like search, right? So on your search page, that's not a page that has a lot of SEO benefit. So it's okay if it renders in later and it's a little bit slower, but it has a lot of interactions, right? Especially if you have like facets or type ahead, type ahead sorting, et cetera, page sizes. It can make a lot of sense to start. One of the areas, yeah, that I commonly decouple first is search just because of the heavy interactions. Uh, maps as well, right? If you have any type of complex mapping, <coughs> mapping solution, that can be a, a good option. Um, I have examples here somewhere. Oh yeah, and charts. Um, that is another good one. So if you have any type of charting, tooling, or uh, especially if you want to change the charts based on user interactions, progressively decoupling that can make a lot of sense. So for Drupal, Drupal use cases uh, for this, really, a lot of, any site that has a lot of content, but only a little bit of interaction, right? One or two pages that are interactive versus mostly static pages, progressively decoupling makes a lot of sense. Um, and then teams with Drupal develop Drupal developers and some J JavaScript skill, or really any team can make this work um, as long as you have enough Drupal talent to, to get the Drupal site off the ground. So that is all of the various approaches. Um, the question is, which one is Drupal? And the answer is all of them, like really. All of them are Drupal, right? So Drupal can serve any of these use cases, unlike other products on the market, Drupal is flexible enough that depending on how you configure it, you can do headed, you can do decoupled, you can do progressively decoupled, you can do headless. Um, it really just depends on how you're configuring Drupal. So like when we're doing headed Drupal, we're just using Twig, right? That's just Drupal out of the box. That's how Drupal works. Drupal kind of defaults to being headed. When we're doing decoupled or headless, we install JSON API, we install GraphQL, we do use REST API, we write some custom endpoints and we can serve all the content we need right out to a, a JavaScript front end. And when we're progressively decoupling, we're just using a mixture of both of them. So really Drupal has all the flexibility you need. If you're evaluating the architecture you need for your site or trying to choose, Drupal shouldn't be knocked down because it's not headless or it's not decoupled because it can fully serve those use cases. Um, and it, the flexibility is really great because it means that if you build your site headed at first, and then you say, I need to add more interaction to this part of the page, you can just progressively decouple that part of the page. You're not just locked into being headed. All right, I believe that's everything. There's a couple bonus terms, which I think we have time for. Um, so when you're in this space, there's a couple other terms that you'll often hear. I'm just gonna cover them real quickly. Uh, especially in the JavaScript ecosystem, you'll hear a lot of these. So static site generation, uh, what this really means is render something once down to HTML and then serve it everywhere until it's re-rendered. Um, and this is something that's touted a lot by JavaScript frameworks as making the site faster and more responsive because you're not rendering for the page request, it's just there and available. Um, Drupal can't, Drupal has options to do fully static site generation but the reality of it is with our cache API and our caching layers, if somebody's visited the page already, Drupal pretty much already is a static site, right? So if your caching layers are working correctly, your cache has all the HTML. It's already statically generated that part of the site. It's just, um, we have an ability to invalidate that with our, our cache API that some JavaScript frameworks don't have. So static site generation, you'll hear that when you're evaluating JavaScript, um, frameworks and on the Drupal side, we don't have static site generation, but we have features and functionality that can make it work very similarly through like I said, cache API varnish, uh, varnish and CDNs. Server side rendering. Uh, so this is another big one that's in the JavaScript ecosystem right now. And all this means is serving HTML and not JavaScript. Um, so it means that somewhere on your server, something is running and when a request is made for a page, instead of returning JavaScript, like most JavaScript frameworks do, you're returning HTML. 
which means that you're not doing any rendering on the client side. It's all coming directly from your server. Um, a huge, big innovation in the JavaScript ecosystem, but it's really just how Drupal works, right? That's just, that's just Drupal. We do all of our rendering through Twig and we serve HTML. It's not really that impressive or weird or special. Um, the alternative to server-side rendering is client-side rendering. So this, for a long time, has been the default with JavaScript frameworks, um, where you'll make a request for a page, you'll get served some JavaScript, that JavaScript will then fetch content from an API and render it all through the user's browser um, and not need a server anywhere. So those are, those are typically the two types of rendering you'll see, in addition to static site generation, which is server-side rendering that caches HTML for the requests. I think I got that right. Uh, the last bonus term here is incremental rebuilds. So when you're doing static site generation or server-side generation and you're caching HTML, you need to be able to invalidate that cache HTML when something changes. Um, and this is something that you'll see touted or explained in JavaScript ecosystems, but it's something that's been built into Drupal for a long time through cache API, right? We have cache tags, we have cache context, um, we have cache max ages, and we just kind of expect that when we change a piece of content in Drupal, Drupal handles invalidating the cache, cache versions of all that content so they can be served new. So that's one of those things that Drupal kind of has built in that is being touted as a feature in the JavaScript ecosystem. It is a little bit different for Drupal. Um, so Drupal's cache invalidation is lazy, meaning that if you change a piece of content, Drupal will invalidate all the places that content is used, but it won't re-render them until it's requested again. So that's lazy. Whereas JavaScript um, incremental rebuilds are usually eager. So when you change a piece of content, it'll rebuild everywhere that that content is used so that it'll be available for the next request and not have to be rendered um, when the request is made. So those are just some of the bonus terms. And I believe that is everything. Yeah, we're at the end. All right. Any questions? Yep. I'm having a little hard time totally visualizing decoupled. Do you know a real world website that you know is Decoupled, um, like fully decoupled. It's really hard to tell, okay. right? Because it's mostly a technical implementation standpoint that matters for the developers. Yeah. Um, you, it would be really hard to tell if like this. You can tell the site is built in React or Vue or something, but you won't be able to tell. Oh, they have a very generic content API that sure. they use in multiple different places. Uh, I was talking with April a little bit earlier today, and Red Hat does something close to it, um, where they have. I think she was calling it learning paths. Um, and April, if you're listening on the recording, I'm sorry if I get this wrong. Um, so they have a bunch of sites where they publish educational content, essentially, or learning content. Okay. And they push it into a central Mongo database. And then that Mongo database is used by a bunch of other sites um, to kind of aggregate the educational material together. OK, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Yep. We have one if you want to look at it. Just a yes, one. It's, it's called matsmart.se. So it's a M A T S M A R T dot S E. S E. Yep, and it's a it's a Swedish grocer oh. that uses Drupal for all the content modeling and middleware integration with ERP. Okay. But then like it's just like like Kyle said, like stream to other services. So there's Findify, which handles product indexing and then search results generation. We have a custom bit of JavaScript, you know, it's, a, it's React based, so React React for like shopping carts and blocks and things. And you know, it's, it's pretty responsive, right? It's, 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 it looks and functions like a single page web app. But it's all it's all decoupled. And the checkout flow is uh, Klarna checkout using a payment service that has like a pretty deep theme. Yeah, but like I said, if you just looked at it, you wouldn't know it's Drupal at all. Yeah. yeah. Although you could, we, there are fingerprints and certain API requests if you know yeah. what to look for. But yeah, if you know what to look for. Yeah. I do want to see a site that's. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. And then, if you wanted to see an example of progressive decoupling, if you go to together.emory.edu, that's their uh, alumni engagement page. Okay. And the Give Now link would take you to a donation platform where Drupal is the content model for donation campaigns. When you actually add a donation to your cart, it's not using it like a React app, kind of embedded on the page. 
didn't provide like a single page cart management checkout experience. Okay. So, and then when you really see the API interaction, this obviously should hold them. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm glad you stepped in, right? Yeah. <laughs> yep. This is one of those questions that's kind of like tangential, but I've been hearing a lot lately, and I've just heard the term HTMX. Yes. This is, uh, I feel like this is sending rendered HTML down the wire, but I don't really know. Yeah, you're not. I'm, I'm kind of familiar. Um, I haven't added to this presentation yet, but the best way I can describe HTMX is Ajax on steroids. Um, so it, you're right. It's essentially a JavaScript library that takes the hypertext media protocol and extends it or makes it work how it was, ever, was supposed to work in originally. So you can like attach things to certain parts of HTML and then you interact with it. And you're right, it makes a request back to the server and then gets HTML back. So, and then replaces it or does whatever it needs to do. Um, that's about as much as I know, but yeah, there's Ajax, it's server-side rendering with JavaScript requests on the client side, something like that. Okay. Any other questions? I know it's kind of in vogue right now, but you mentioned it briefly, um, like decoupling in order to avoid having to upgrade the Drupal 10. Mm -hmm. is, there, is a reasonable course of action. <laughs> Depending on the site and how complex it is, you basically could just obscure the fact that Drupal 6 is still running your site. Drupal 6? <laughs> yeah, I, I have a customer that they do tens of millions of dollars in sales a year, and it's Drupal 6 behind the scenes, oh, yeah. and fully decoupled to run it. I, I don't recommend it. Yeah, <laughs> it's certainly but not. You can. I mean, <laughs> if, if they want to write the API layer for Drupal 6, yeah, yeah. kudos to them. Um, but yeah, certainly if you can come up with a security posture to protect your Drupal backend and you just want to expose an API for your content, it could be in a way a way to run it in secure Drupal version in the long term. I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. All right then. Thank you so Thanks for coming. Much.